Welcome to Curator's Corner, Dark Persuasion with Joel E. Dimsdale. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum here in Washington, DC. Thank you so much for joining us today. Spy Museum historian and curator, Dr. Andrew Hammond, will be talking with Joel about his new book, Dark Persuasion, a history of brainwashing from Pavlov to social media in just a few moments. We've had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Dimsdale in the past, and we knew we wanted to have him with us to discuss his findings on mind control. Joel is Distinguished Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry at University of California, San Diego. He obtained his psychiatric training at Massachusetts General Hospital and then completed a fellowship in psychology at the New England Regional Primate Center. He was on the faculty of Harvard Medical School from 1976 until 1985 when he moved west to the warmer weather at UCSD. He consults widely to government agencies and is the author and editor of many, many works, including Anatomy of Malice, The Enigma of the Nazi War Criminals. He is a former career awardee of the American Heart Association and is past president of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research the American Psychosomatic Society, and the Society of Behavioral Medicine. Now, over to you, Andrew and Joel. Well, it's a real pleasure to speak to you, Joel. And one of the things that um, Amanda didn't mention in your bio there was that you've also done a lot of research and sleep apnea. So on behalf of my mother, I want to thank you for doing the Lord's work. Um, I know that she'll be particularly appreciative of that. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope she's getting CPAP treatment or whatever, and that, uh, that it's helping her. So that is my father, but she'll be appreciative of your research. <laughs> but but um, yeah, uh, so I know that there's an interesting origin story for this book. Can you just tell our listeners how you first uh, came across this topic and what led you to write it, because it's quite a it's quite a bleak one, um, and I suppose some of our listeners will be thinking, what, why did some, why is someone who lives in a place with over three hundred days of sunshine a year write such a bleak book? So, yeah, tell our listeners a lot about more. Well, Andrew, I've always been interested and puzzled by how people make awful decisions. And uh, in my previous book, Anatomy of Malice, I studied the Nazi cabinet ministers who orchestrated uh, genocide. But I realized that that didn't address other questions, uh, how a populace gets persuaded to do things. Some people have suggested that people are inherently murderous. Other people have said, well, it's all propaganda. And then some people have said, well, it's brainwashing. And as I thought about that, I realized I, I had no idea where that term came from, how it developed. And so I started doing some reading about it. But I, I probably never would have written this book had it not been for my neighbors. We moved to San Diego back in 1985 and lived out in the countryside in the north part of the county. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, and our neighbors had themselves castrated and then committed a mass suicide. This was the Heaven's Gate commune. And you know, when something like this happens half a world away, you can tune it out. But when it's in your own backyard, so to speak, it demands study. So 
I started musing and reading more seriously about how people can be coercively persuaded to do things like this. You know, brainwashing is just a hideously flamboyant term. Uh, the, the term that all of the experts prefer is coercive persuasion. But culturally, we don't have a chance. I, I, I looked up on Google and, and um, there are something like 36 million web pages on brainwashing against 48,000 on coercive persuasion. So um, culturally, people just prefer the, the brainwashing term. And I'll, I'll slip into that from time to time. But I, th I think the what, what I've tried to focus on in the book is what are the, some of the techniques that were used in coercive persuasion and how did they evolve over a century? And with, with, uh, with coercive persuasion, just, just really briefly tell us what those techniques are or what some of them are, because there's a variety of different case studies in your book that range from um, MK Ultra to uh, Patty Hearst to Stockholm Syndrome. So just help us understand some of the techniques that can be used for coercive persuasion, aka brainwashing. Okay. So what I tried to do in the book was to highlight the, the most commonly cited instances of purported brainwashing. Some of them fit well, some of them may not fit so well. And I tried to lay that out. But um, obviously as a species, we've been coercing each other for millennia, but things really changed in the time of Ivan Pavlov around the time of World War I and the Russian Revolution. Because what Pavlov did that was quite different was to bring scientific precision. He was a very methodical investigator. He could train his dogs to respond to a note of C as opposed to a C sharp uh, on a piano. He was that precise. He got interested in this area largely as a result of an unusual flood that hit St. Petersburg. The, um, his dog labs were in the basement adjacent to the river and the river flooded and uh, no one was there uh, in the labs. The water rose in the basement until the dogs were virtually floating in their crates with their little nostrils, just snouts, just barely snuffling the, the air. At the last minute, an animal handler rushed in, but in order to get the dogs out, he had to dunk them under the water, open the crate and get them out. What Pavlov observed was that the dogs were never the same. I'm getting, I'm getting around to answer your question. Forgive me for going off on a tangent. The dogs were never the same. The stress had wiped out their memories. It had obliterated their memories and it changed their dispositions as well. So that some dogs that had previously been submissive uh, became very aggressive and vice versa. Pavlov then was uh, very keen to understand what circumstances can change behavior so remarkably. In a curious sort of way, his work was supported by the uh, incipient Soviet Union. Lenin came to visit Pavlov and came and spent two hours. It was not just a photo op visit at all. And Lenin asked, well, we communists need to 
make a new Soviet man. <coughs> Can you help us with that? And Pavlov, just to be clear, said, you mean you want, want me to help remake and shape behavior for the Soviet Union? And Lenin said, yes, uh, exactly. Whereupon Lenin and subsequently Stalin funded Pavlov a great deal. Keep in mind that in the early days of the Soviet Union, there was famine, there was extreme poverty. The, the early Soviets built Pavlov an institute and staffed it with 357 postdocs, research assistants, animal handlers, because they were convinced that the science of behavior change was something that was very important to them. So what did, what did the Soviets wind up doing? Uh, you know, in the show trials in the 30s, we beheld some remarkable, unlikely confessions by leading early Bolsheviks. And there was a question of how the Soviets had elicited this. Some people thought it was black magic. Uh, others thought that it was some mysterious secret weapon. But if you really get into it, a lot of it was simple brutality. So that uh, when you work in the archives uh, in Russia today and you dig out some of those confessions, some of the confessions are bloodstained. Uh, so there was certainly there was brutality, but also, and in a way, this gets back to how you, we started off this conversation. The Soviets were fascinated about sleep and fascinated about the restorative effects of sleep and conversely, the disruptive effects of sleep restriction and um, total sleep uh, uh, withdrawal. The Soviets also were following, I guess, Pavlov's playbook most precisely when it came to being methodical. They didn't feel that they needed to break someone immediately, and they had no confidence that that would work. Instead, they summoned people back, wore them down, malnourished them, rewarded them for little confessions, and slowly were able to persuade people to make confessions which actually led to their executions. Now, as to other instances, many things have been done. The, uh, it's not just a function of the Cold War at all, and it's not Russian or American. Uh, as I say, it, it begins much earlier than the Cold War, and the work goes on today all over the world. And it's some of it is done by people who were crappy scientists, and some of it was uh, some of the work was done by Nobel laureates like Pavlov. Some people were morally challenged in doing this work, and some uh, were quite careful and ethical. So I, I, as a historian, I think history happens at that intersection where the individual meets social forces. And that's what interested me in writing the book, to see the remarkable differences in brainwashing across these different sorts of scenarios. I find that quite interesting what you said there uh, about the Cold War um, and you know it seems to me that of course that doesn't uh, the history of coercive persuasion can't be reduced to that but it's quite interesting the role that the uh, 
ideological conflict of the 20th century plays here. So even broader than the Cold War, so you mentioned Pavlov and, and the Soviet Union, the new Soviet man attempts to remodel and, and re-educate human beings in a particular way. And I'm, I'm fast forwarding to the Khmer Rouge and the, 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 the thought reform and, and getting the kids to upend traditional cultural mores where you respect the elderly. Instead, they were, were, were particularly vicious towards those that were older than them. And then also just thinking about the, the militaristic, nationalistic, uh, authoritarian powers and wor World War II as well. So Unit 731 in Japan, uh, Joseph Mengele, you know, th those sorts of things. So across the 20th century, we see all of these efforts to try to intervene to, to mold the human beings in a particular way or to refashion them along the lines of politics or national ideology or so forth. So I find that really, really interesting, the, the way that it, that it digs into the whole history of the 20th century. Yeah, you know, it's, it's fascinating. When you look back, um, you know, World War was not a, a war about ideology at all. It was a war for territory, a certain amount of <coughs> personal bickering between ruling, uh, ruling families in the dying days of monarchy in, uh, uh, in Europe. But what happened with the Cold War was that this was a doctrine. These were doctrinal struggles. It wasn't just to defeat the enemy and acquire uh, the territory, to be sure, some of that was involved, but no, the, the effort was to convert the enemy. Uh, if we could persuade the enemy to defect or uh, stop our people from defecting, this was an enormous part of the Cold War, so that this issue of of persuading people coercively to believe in something became very important. Uh, I would say beginning in a little bit in the 30s and 40s, and then wham, with the end of World War II and the start of the Cold War, we saw this in bold relief everywhere. And, you know, what's interesting is that the efforts were made in all sorts of ways, in pharmacology, uh, in psychology, in surgery, there were all sorts of biobehavioral, biomedical efforts to see whether you could force people to do things. Probably uh, an interesting instance of this is with the truth serums. The uh, could we administer a drug that could extract information from people. This is something that consumed both sides in World War II. The, uh, were basically the Nazis and the allies both were working to repurpose drugs that had been used in a different way uh, to see whether they would help. And that's where Again, academia and government service worked together. Government needed uh, academic research techniques to frame the studies well. Academics were, of course, very happy to accept governmental funding uh, uh, as well. The, uh, the Nazis experimented with mescaline uh, in Dachau um, and slipped it into the inmates' coffee, found that it made the inmates somewhat more garrulous, but the Nazis were not convinced that it was useful. Uh, the United States was very keen, uh, curiously, on marijuana. Uh, this was something that was studied extensively and again, 
what we learned was that you could sedate people, you could jazz them up with amphetamines, you could confuse them with psychedelics, but it, it wasn't terribly revelatory about uh, extracting uh, information from an unwilling uh, uh, captive. And one of the one of the things that I was wondering as well, like on reading your book, the different examples that you give, I just wondered if we could break that down in terms of the individual uh, and then going up to the social forces that you described. So with a say, for example, with an individual, you have the various chemicals, dopamine, uh, serotonin, oxytocin you give a, a great example in the book maybe you could uh, spray aerosol oxytocin and a group to make them come closer together so i so so we've got the chemical part then we've got um just the the the, the kind of mental architecture that human beings inherently have built into them and then you have the social and i just wondered about the interplay of all of them so chemicals evolution biology and then the social where does where does mind control end and social control begin um let me work my way into that and and if i go off on a tangent bring me back because that's that's a really important question i think the you were talking about oxytocin and aerosols probably the most thorough research program that we did was with LSD. And this is, uh, it's been a forgotten uh, element. And I'm not talking about LSD and Baba Ramdas and Allen Ginsberg and, and the Dan Beatles. Kidder. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about a concerted effort to define the dose that was necessary to discombobulate someone to search for an antidote to see whether there is tachyphylaxis or adaptation to repeated doses so that you need to change the dose to get an effect there was a lot of interest in this a lot of uh, work went into this a lot of this was part of what came to be known as the Manhattan Project of the Mind, where enormous resources were deployed to examine various instances of uh, coerc coercive change in behavior. The LSD, uh, I think it's one of the more sordid chapters in this whole history, in that there was a lot of surreptitious dosing I'm not talking about dosing of volunteers but surreptitious dosing uh, all over the united states uh, prisoners college students uh, people in a bar and without getting into whether lsd is good or bad safe or not safe the, the one thing that's pretty clear is that if you've been inadvertently dosed and you don't know about it, it's a terrifying situation. The, uh, there were efforts to develop an LSD aerosol. So I'm coming back to the oxytocin slowly. And uh, aerosol administration is tricky because of wind flow. And um, uh, so they, the agency took it to uh, Marin County uh, uh, in the Bay Area and sprayed it at a party. Um, unfortunately, the wind blew the wrong way. And so it just blew out the window and the party continued unchanged. But there were other studies that had been very methodically done. Again, surreptitiously, uh, the... Uh, Probably the most notorious is the Operation Midnight Climax, uh, where the agency rented out an apartment in Telegraph Hill, 
and hired some prostitutes to slip some LSD in the drink of uh, their Johns to see whether LSD would elicit more self-revelatory information. We, we learned a certain amount from these sorts of studies. Uh, we learned just how dangerous surreptitious dosing could be. But there were other studies as well. And the studies were generally funded out of uh, cut out foundations, which in turn funded academics. The, uh, actually in Washington, the Geschichter Foundation, uh, Geschichter was a prominent pathologist who studied breast cancer, but he also set up a foundation um, setting up a safe house at, in, within Georgetown Hospital to, to try knockout drops and all sorts of things. Uh, there were a lot of efforts to get science involved. Uh, the, um, when this all blew up and came under congressional investigation, Geschichter initially said, oh, he didn't remember any of this and that it was university's sloppy bookkeeping that certainly must have been responsible. And those of us who've worked in universities know that there's plenty of sloppy bookkeeping, but he seemed to have a, a, a lot of memory problems for all of these studies that they went on and until he got to a study where they were looking at, I think it was, uh, microwave um, distance wave transmission and uh, uh, its effect on behavior. And he said, oh yes, I do remember that one. You had to get the dose right because otherwise um, you could wind up, um, I, I try to remember the polite way he put it, but you could wind up frying the brain uh, of people. So there was always an interest in the neuroscience of coercion. I, I think today we could do a lot more, a lot more safely and probably more effectively. And that makes it all the more challenging from an ethical point of view do we have sufficient ethical restraint to avoid doing such things <clears throat> i guess on another front you have to ask yourself so if you're trying to extract information from someone or if you're trying to prevent one of your people from disclosing information, we don't yet have a precise enough topography of the brain to be assured that there's not a backup function in a different part of the brain. You may be able to, to uh, uh, needle a certain area of the brain, but that doesn't guarantee that you have destroyed uh, all traces elsewhere. That gets into the problem of memory obliteration. Uh, and there, there were appalling things done in the 60s. I don't know whether many of you uh, in the audience are keen on Jason Bourne, um, the books and movies. I, I adore them. I, I just think they are terrific, very compelling. and. The, you recall the plot, Matt Damon plays Jason Bourne, a somewhat unhappy um, uh, military guy who goes to see an avuncular psychiatrist who says, well, I can fix you. I'll just wipe out all your memories and train you to do something else. Uh, and I'll train you to become the consummate assassin. Well, that was all true, except for the consummate assassin bit. Uh, 
and the work was done up in Montreal by a very prominent psychiatrist at the time who obliterated memory with massive doses of electroconvulsive therapy and insulin coma, LSD, mescaline, any and every drug he could throw at, at people. And then he tried sleep learning by playing repeated uh, messages. He, he thought psychotherapy was um, inefficient and that if you just could, could move to a tabula rasa and start with a blank slate, things would go better, and he would boil down to the essence the each patient's crucial issue, and he'd play it repeatedly while the patient slept over the course of a month, a quarter of a million repetitions. When all this work was done, he found that he could obliterate memory pretty successfully, but he was not able to um, force people to think in, uh, in, in new ways uh, <clears throat> with all this sleep learning. I, I guess from the intelligence agency's point of view, these are important questions, but they, they didn't lead to as striking results as people wished. And you have to really look at kidnappers and clerics if you really want to see who can be effective. Uh, you mentioned the Patty Hearst case. Well, the Patty Hearst case was preceded six months prior by the Credit Banken uh, robbery in Stockholm, from whence comes the description of the Stockholm syndrome, where hostages uh, somehow start to become fond of the hostage taker. It's a paradoxical situation, and, and I think the Government agencies are still unsure what to make of it, but there's there's something there's a database uh, called the hostage and uh, and barricade situations database. There's a dishearteningly vast amount of information about hostages, kidnapping victims, terrorist victims, hijackers. Uh, I had no idea that we had so much data on so many thousands of people. What's clear is that if you're violent enough and if it's protracted enough, and if you as the perpetrator are mildly courteous, you elicit some warmth and trust on the part of the victim. And some of that trust is um, oddly enough functional for, for both, both sides. I mean, if, the, if you're taking a hostage, you as the criminal want to get out of there alive, and obviously the victim wants to get out of there alive. It's, it's in both of your interests to get along on some level. The uh, curious thing is that the data suggest that the hostage may be right in getting along. If you, if you look at all the data where uh, police have tried to extract the hostage from the kidnapper, the victim is four times more likely to be shot, shot inadvertently by the police than by the hostage taker. So it's, it's, it's troubling stuff. And where this comes very close into the brainwashing or coercive persuasion direction is identifying who is vulnerable. 
children are more vulnerable. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. And there's a, I would say, a whisper of a suggestion that people who've been less involved in the world, maybe less sophisticated, are slightly more influenceable in a, in a situation of a hostage taking situation. But, you know, I've spent all my life as a medical researcher doing clinical trials, trying to get a sense for does this intervention help and how much does it help? And when you look at the spread of how frequently the Stockholm situation develops, the range is just uncomfortably uh, broad. One study reported, I think 95% of people uh, become uh, show manifestations of Stockholm syndrome, and another study shows 10%. So this is, uh, uh, I, we're not sure where this is going with, with the Stockholm uh, situation. I, I mean, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I found interesting about your book was the examples that you give, uh, we don't need to dig into this too much, but the, some of the examples you give, uh, Jonestown, uh, the Partyhurst case, and the, um, the Heaven's Gate, uh, one of them was led by a preacher, one of them was the son of a preacher, and one of them was adopted by a preacher. So that goes back to the religious component that you, that you mentioned. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying there's a causal thing going on there. I just think it's, it's interesting. But one of the things that I wanted to ask was... Um, you know, as a, I guess, I guess I'm just not sure, like, where does, because when people think of mind, of coercive persuasion or brainwashing, they think of probably like the Scooby-Doo movies where you just have an individual and their eyes go all like whirly and they do whatever you want them to do. So that it's like a much more localized, almost clinical type of intervention. But some of the examples you, you give in the book, like, social media um, or some of the other things there they're much broader they're this this more overarching thing so uh, like I'm still not really sure what the difference is between social control and mind control and and just just thinking about same me and you Joe like every human being is thrown into the world and then from birth from our parents from the education system you know the pink, the pink Floyd song, the wall, we don't need no education, we don't need no thought control, uh, through to the, the country we live in, the, the institutions that we're a part of. Why is that any different from coercive persuasion? Surely we're coercively persuaded in all kinds of ways from the moment we're born. Are you saying that coercive persuasion means that you think one set of things, but then you're coercively persuaded to think something else is that is that what the difference is so th that's the key question isn't it uh, and i think this is where it's it's a question of of definition w what the hell is brainwashing what the hell is coercive persuasion um i think what i would like to argue is that there's a there are a whole bunch of Imagine a word cloud, a whole bunch of words kind of floating around education, persuasion, conversion, indoctrination, coercion. I, I, it's not going to get us very far if we say all of those are brainwashing. I think the, the question is, what is in the what is in the guts or marrow of brainwashing so we could look at it and understand it better? I, I would argue that it's coercive force that is accomplished in a context of isolation or sensory restriction. Uh, 
it's usually augmented in states of sleep restriction and it's usually imposed in situations of great danger sometimes with surreptitious um, manipulation and i think with with those sorts of of characteristics we can then ask the question that that i think you've asked me twice and i i'm finally going to get around to it um, <laughs> um uh, so, we, we can get to this question about social media um so um yeah how does social media fit into that definition so that's that's the crucial thing um so if and I don't know the answer to this. I don't even have a Facebook account. I need to, to acknowledge that right away. Um, but if social media has strong conformity pressures, if it encourages imitation behavior, if it uses targeting um, of audiences carefully, if it um, imposes this in an ever more restrictive environment in terms of information disclosure, if it has surreptitious algorithms behind it that uh, uh, manipulate what information you have access to, you have to ask, um, is this starting to tippy toe down the path to coercive persuasion? I, th I think the, the trouble with social media is that um, it's an amazingly appealing new toy. And we humans don't do well with exposure to new toys. They become addictive. They become socially contagious. And it takes years to develop the social norms, expectations to regulate this. And in our country, uh, it will take longer uh, because we have certain values about freedom of expression that other countries uh, don't uh, take to that extent. So uh, I do think that there's something in there in the, on the social media front that we have to take very seriously uh, as far as risks uh, in the future. Just when you were talking there, it reminded me of an argument I read in a book once that was talking about uh, alcoholism amongst uh, native communities in the americas and one of the arguments was that because it wasn't as much a part of their culture as it was say in europe then there just wasn't the the kind the culture wasn't built in a way to kind of deal with it but what you're saying is that we are dealing with something that no culture has dealt with before that also hacks humans because you can get a short term dopamine rush from checking your Twitter feed or doing something on Facebook. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it exactly. And, and you know, there are plenty of examples. You, you mentioned the Native Americans as, as another example. Curiously, crossword puzzles uh, were introduced around, uh, I think, around 1913. And um, we had this. Um, glut of train wrecks because the train engineers were so riveted to working their crossword puzzles that they weren't driving the train. And that was from 1913. It took a long time to get control of the crossword puzzle um, issue for train engineers. Now, of course, we have issues with texting, uh, uh, driving um, for driving in traffic, driving trains, whatever. It, we just takes time uh, when, when um, and as far as uh, alcohol or drugs are concerned, uh, 
there are plenty of other instances uh, in the 17th century gin was introduced to to England and had absolutely devastating effects uh, on the country. It was so cheap, it was so strong. There were uh, there were no social mores to protect people against that. And one of the one of the things that I also just before I hand it over to Amanda, one of the things that I was also interested in was it, it seems to me that there is a there is a difference with and just bear with me on this. There does seem to be a qualitative difference with, say, social media and some of the other examples. And the thing that I'm thinking about is intentionality. So, in 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 other cases, you know, Stalin, Lenin, they wanted to actively reshape and and produce the new Soviet man with Jonestown or the other examples, they wanted to gain control over these people. But with, with say, Twitter, and I haven't spoken to their CEO or founder, but I, I think that they just want to make money. And I think, that, I think that for Twitter and Facebook, making money is what they're doing. They're not intentionally trying to like remold to remold you to make you something else. That's just a byproduct. So, so that's a. That, it seems to me that that's one step further removed for the social media companies. Would you agree? So, let me ask: What if they? What if the the future Facebooks were motivated not by making money but had an intentionality? Um. How powerful would that be? And uh, the ability to do deep fakes, these are very powerful techniques. Perhaps right now it's uh, done somewhat randomly, but the algorithms are starting to feed us in certain directions and the sponsors uh, are interested in getting our attention. There is nothing that uh, precludes uh, social media in the future that is explicitly targeting a, a political agenda. And certainly, I think one would, would have to say that there are many sites right now that already do that. And I think that that's a good point where it's going in the future. And to me, it seems like that that could be something that transpires. And I think that one of the struggles in the future is going to be the struggle for reality. And in that role, social media is going to play a very important role. Um, and in the book, you mentioned the example of China and hundreds of millions of fake social media posts uh, saying how great things were and so forth. But anyway, over, over to Amanda. Thanks, thanks so much. Really fascinating conversation and, and lots of questions. I know we want, we won't get to all of them, but I, I liked this one. This all sounds scary. Can there be any positive purposes for studying and promoting mind control? Well, it's a tool. Uh, and how do you use a tool? With, with what motivation? We, uh, a few minutes ago, we were talking about some of the neuroscience directions that were uh, uh, developed in the 50s and 60s. And, um, uh, what investigators observed for clinical, and I would say uh, admirable, well-intentioned clinical studies, they found that through uh, targeting certain areas of the brain with a stimulation of certain areas of the brain, you could really help people. And um, uh, again, as you know, I do work on sleep research and Certainly narcolepsy is a somewhat rare, terribly disabling condition. The um, 
investigators found that by stimulating a certain area of the brain on some patients, they could wake them enough so that they could, for the first time in their life, hold a job. Uh, today, we're already using uh, direct brain stimulation for all sorts of purposes. Uh, and it's not used for behavior control, but it's used to help patients with Parkinson's disease you know, for movement disorders. It's uh, used sometimes uh, for patients with refractory depression. So there are applications of some, even some of these scary uh, techniques that uh, are potentially uh, helpful. I think social media, I don't want to come across as, as uh, an old Luddite, although I am old. Uh, I mean, social media is, uh, it's beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a way of connecting. Uh, it's a way of reaching out to a certain extent what we're doing right now. I'm here in San Diego. Many of you are in Washington. Uh, we can get together. We can talk about things that we care about, that we're worried about, that we're interested in. And um, social media allows that. It's a tool. Tools are powerful. We have to be concerned with how they are used. Um is there is there a way to inure people to brainwashing? Ah, uh, that was that was a topic that was of exceeding importance to intelligence communities, and um, a great deal of effort was was deployed on this. And uh, curiously, uh, particularly in the truth serum line of research, so. Perhaps it's just tradecraft, but uh, people need to have a cover story that they can reveal that is somewhat true and the, to be able to withhold some uh, of the, the core issue of, of uh, what they're trying to, to keep secret. So this was... Uh, a lot of effort was spent in that area. There was also some effort uh, and uh, in coaching people that look, the, the whole military SEER program, uh, for instance, is, is coaching people on survival and resistance. The intelligence community uh, suggested that you can just say wild and crazy things if you're on if you know you've been drugged with something just say wild and crazy things so wild and crazy that they won't they won't really they'll leave you alone after a while so there there were some efforts made along these lines and the other other thing that was uh, suggested was that you know the most terrifying thing that people experienced was the drug-induced madness. Insanity, severe psychosis is a horror. I wouldn't wish that on my deepest enemy. If this just comes upon you, you are absolutely terrorized. And uh, uh, people were cautioned that this may happen to you. You may start hallucinating and know that this is uh, a drug that you've been administered. So yes, there have been ways of trying to coach people how they might be able to resist. That is very interesting. Um, very detailed question here about, seems like brainwashing and propaganda are very different from coercive acts like getting confessions from prisoners why do you equate them well um i don't equate propaganda to brainwashing i think that's um uh, it's slippery i admittedly they are in the same family of trying to persuade someone 
I think with most propaganda, you can turn it off. You don't have to listen to XYZ news um, if you don't want to. You can turn it off, arguably. With brainwashing, the degree of coercion that you're exposed to makes it very difficult to turn it off. If you are, to begin with, sequestered and can't escape from the situation, you can't just close your ears. You're being bombarded with the, the messages. Um, in Jonestown, for instance, first off, the, the settlement was in the midst of the jungle uh, and was far from anywhere. It was surrounded by a fence. Jones broadcast sermons constantly uh, across the PA system. People were worked uh, increasingly so that they were very lucky to get four hours or five hours of sleep in the latter days of the Jonestown settlement. I think there's a difference between something like that and propaganda. I, and I, 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 I don't want to say propaganda from the left or right. You pick what, 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 what the source is. I think the degree of coercion involved makes it a different, uh, a different beast. We have just a tiny moment, but we have to talk about everybody's favorite brainwashing movie. Any truth to the premise behind the Manchurian candidate is one of the first questions that came in. What a wonderful movie. What a wonderful movie. Uh, I, 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 um, I see no evidence I wouldn't buy that premise. I would buy the Jason Bourne premise uh, in comparison. Wow. Well, we love your pop culture illusions because as we know at the Spy Museum, it's the way a lot of people find their way into the real content. Andrew, before I wrap this up with our phenomenal guests, do you have any final remarks? Yeah, I think just uh, on the topic of popular culture, I would recommend also the Ipcris file with Michael Caine from 1965, and also Parallax Error with Warren Beatty from the uh, early 70s, I believe, and also novels. I think that A Clockwork Orange has a you know really powerful. Um, I'm talking about the novel, but the the the, the movie too, sure. Uh, and also things like Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much more I could give, but those would be some of my top tips. Well, I think everyone is so used to binge watching at home themselves that they may do better with that exposure to imagery that is so famous in, in the Clockwork Orange film scenes. But we are still selecting what we binge watch as as Joel makes it clear, choosing to turn something off or not read it is a valuable tool that we have, you know, at our disposal to stop being impacted. But this has just been so, so good, so interesting. We did not get to the many, many questions, but we will share them with Joel and Andrew. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And our next um, virtual program is on Thursday at noon Eastern. It is Spy Chat with Chris Costa and his guest Thursday will be um, Javed Ali. And if you'd like to register for that or any of our other programs, look at our calendar online. And also while you're on our website, if you would like to uh, show your support for our mission and our programs and our exhibitions, you can also make a contribution there. So thanks everyone for being here. Keep your brain under your own control. And thanks so much, Joel. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. Thank you.